the primary goal of representation learning is to produce some efficient representation of the underlying data. Now this representation can be continuous, as in a variational autoencoder, or it could be discrete. And in fact, when we use language to describe something, like an image, we're actually distilling a continuous representation into a discrete one. This is the basic motivation behind the Vector Quantized Variational Autoencoder, or VQVAE, which is basically a variant of the VAE in which the latent representation is discretized or quantized. So instead of having an infinite number of possible latent vectors, we now have to choose from a limited collection, which is known as our codebook. Now this clearly constrains our latent representation, so why would we do this? Well, in this video, we'll explore why we might want to quantize, and how the VQVAE achieves this. We'll do this by first refreshing ourselves on the regular VAE, then seeing how the VQVAE modifies this basic scheme. And finally, we'll talk about some of the benefits of quantization. So the VAE is basically a probabilistic latent variable model that encodes a data point to a distribution in latent space, and also decodes a point in latent space to a distribution in data space. The idea here is that we have some target distribution in data space, say the distribution of chairs, and we want to map this to a pre-specified prior distribution in latent space. The idea being that if we then sample from our prior distribution in latent space, we're going to get some chairs in data space. So when we put some data point x into our model, the corresponding latent vector z is sampled from a Gaussian distribution whose parameters are defined by the encoder. The sampling is controlled by a stochastic variable eta. Then finally, our reconstruction y is produced using the decoder. Now the model as a whole is trained using a two-part loss function. The first part is a reconstruction loss that rewards the decoder based on the log likelihood of the original data. And then we have a distribution or KL divergence loss that penalizes the divergence of the posterior latent distributions from our pre-specified prior distribution. So we basically have four essential elements here. We have a continuous latent encoding, a Gaussian sampling procedure in the latent space, a pre-specified latent prior distribution, and a loss function that penalizes on reconstruction and KL divergence. Now we're gonna see how the VQVAE modifies all four. The first important element is the discrete latent encoding. So let's take a look at how this works. So our model as a whole has three trainable components, the encoder, the decoder, and the codebook. The codebook is defined by two hyperparameters, the dimension of the latent space D and the number of latent vectors or code words K. So in the forward pass, our input X is first fed through our encoder. For example, we may have some red, green, blue image, which is 128 pixels wide, 128 pixels tall, and three channels deep. If our encoder is a convolutional neural network, then this may condense our image to a feature representation which could be, say, 4 pixels wide, 4 pixels tall, and 16 channels deep. So we essentially have 4 by 4, 16-dimensional feature vectors, which we treat as our encoding latent vectors, ZE. This also means that our codebook dimension D is equal to 16. So now we've reached the quantization step. Here, each encoding latent ZE gets replaced by the closest code word in the codebook. So this code word then becomes our quantized latent ZQ. And here, closeness is just measured using L2 norm or Euclidean distance. So basically, each encoding vector ZE snaps onto the closest code word in the codebook to become the quantized vector ZQ. So every latent that's fed to the decoder has to be part of the codebook. Okay, so now the final step is just to pass our quantized latent to the decoder network, which simply outputs our reconstruction Y. So now we've already established one key difference with the regular VAE. While the VAE uses continuous codes, the VQVAE uses a discrete codebook with a nearest neighbor lookup during the forward pass. Now you may have noticed that during the forward pass, there is in fact no random sampling. And that's correct. Unlike in the regular VAE, the forward pass of the VQVAE is completely deterministic. 
this is a second major difference. But how can we square this deterministic picture with the probabilistic modeling framework of the VAE? Well, recall that in a VAE, we have a predefined prior, and we're essentially trying to match the target distribution in data space with this prior in latent space. As such, the prior essentially biases the latent posteriors due to the presence of our KL divergence term. Our prior and posteriors are all Gaussians, so the only way to bring the KL divergence term to zero is to make our posteriors all have a mean of zero and a variance of one, which means that they're equal to the prior. Now the VQVAE picture is a little different. Instead of using a Gaussian distribution as our prior and posterior, we instead have a categorical distribution. And this is simply the probability of choosing any particular code word index k. Now, of course, the nearest neighbor lookup procedure is deterministic, so our posterior has a probability of 1 for the nearest neighbor index and 0 elsewhere. But what about our prior? Well, during training, we actually do not wish to bias our model in the code word indices that it chooses. So our prior is just a uniform categorical distribution with each index having probability 1 over big K, which is our codebook size. Right, so given this prior and posterior, it's now possible to calculate our KL divergence. First, we take our KL divergence formula for discrete variables. Then we apply this over all codebook indices K. Now the posterior is zero for all but the nearest neighbor, and for this it's equal to one. So we can write this as simply log one over one over big K, or just log big K. So basically our KL divergence is a constant that just depends on the codebook size big K. As such, it never features in our training objective. Now here we should note that even though we don't wish to bias the code word selection during training, we may notice after the model is trained that the joint distribution of code words across our data set is not a uniform distribution. So for example, in our data set of chairs, we may notice that having one code word in location one might prejudice or condition the distribution of possible code words in location two, and so on, such that if we stray from this distribution, we'll end up with something other than a chair. So even though our prior is kept fixed and uniform during training, in some sense, there is a true prior that reflects the distribution of chairs. And this is actually learnt during training and does not necessarily have to be equal to the uniform prior we had before. This kind of conditionality is also very apparent in domains such as language modeling, where subsequent code words should clearly depend on previous code words. Now this is clearly different to our VAE framework. In the VAE, the prior is predefined and fixed, while as we've mentioned in the VQVAE, we have a true prior that is learnt during training. However, there's one difficulty with this scheme, and that is, even though our model has implicitly learnt some kind of true prior, we don't actually know what it is. So the authors of the VQVAE paper propose using a secondary model an autoregressive model to learn the appropriate probability distribution over code words. Now the basic idea is that we should incrementally build our code word selection via ancestral sampling. This just means that we sample one variable first, then sample the rest consecutively from distributions conditioned on the previous or ancestor variables. So say we want to sample some image from the learned prior, what we would do is first generate all of our code words by ancestral sampling in a raster scan order until we've selected every code word. And then we just decode as usual. Now, of course, the question is, how do we learn these conditional distributions to use in our sampling? And that's where the use of autoregressive models comes in. So for the VQVAE paper, the authors use a pixel CNN to learn the prior for images and they use a WaveNet for audio. Now, of course, given the discrete token-like nature of the latents, we can use transformers as well. Okay, so now we've seen how the VQVAE is unique in the sense that it has a deterministic posterior and also a true prior that has to be learnt using secondary autoregressive models. The only thing left to talk about is the loss function, 
And as it turns out, there is quite a lot to talk about here. So we've already established that there is no KL divergence loss, but we still have a reconstruction loss in the form of this negative log likelihood here. Now the calculation of this loss depends on all three components of the model, the encoder parameterized by phi, the decoder parameterized by theta, and the codebook, which we denote as big C. Now realize that there is no longer an expectation over the posterior, because now the posterior is deterministic. Now the way we would transmit gradients through a neural network is typically through backpropagation, and we could do that just fine for the decoder. But we hit a problem at this quantization step here, and that's because the quantization operation is not differentiable. Therefore we cannot transmit gradients to the encoder and codebook via backpropagation. The very simple solution is to simply copy over the gradients from ZQ to ZE. In other words, the gradient is simply passed straight through the quantization layer, which is why this trick is called straight through estimation. We're basically estimating the gradient that ZE should get using the gradient of ZQ as an approximation. Now the use of straight through estimation would work best in this context if ZQ were a good approximation of ZE. And this is why it makes sense to use a nearest neighbor lookup as our quantization procedure. However, the flexibility of our encoder and our model as a whole would be severely limited if our codebook vectors had to remain static. And here, the problem is that even though straight through estimation can pass gradients to the encoder, it still doesn't pass any gradients to the codebook, which is randomly initialized at the beginning of training. So, in order to optimize the codebook, we have to introduce a second loss term called the codebook loss. And this basically just penalizes each code word vector E based on its square distance from its associated encoding vector ZE. Now note the existence of this stop gradient operator here, and all this basically does is it sets the gradient of the thing inside it to zero during the backward pass. So basically, this loss does not provide any gradient signal to the encoder, even though the encodings are required for its calculation. As such, it only optimizes the codebook. Now, you might be wondering, what about those code words that never get chosen in the batch and therefore don't show up in the loss? Well, the quick answer is nothing happens to them and they don't get updated at all. So this is a sparse loss in the sense that it targets only a subset of code word vectors, which are those that are chosen during quantization. Okay, so we can already see how this second term helps ensure that the encoded latent and the quantized latent are close to each other. But left with just this loss function, we may experience some undesirable behaviors during training. The first is when our encoding fluctuates too wildly between different code vectors. This is especially prone to happening if our encoder parameters train more quickly than our codebook. Now fluctuations are undesirable because they lead to instability during training, and they could also lead to inefficient codebook utilization, which can include some redundancy between code words. Now the second undesirable behavior is when the encoding vector grows arbitrarily large as training progresses. If this just so happens to improve reconstruction, then it will be encouraged and the relevant code word will try to follow along. But very large encodings are undesirable as they can lead to training instability. Now the issue is that since the codebook loss does not penalize the encoder, the encoding is never encouraged to move itself closer to the code vector. To rectify both these issues, we add a third loss term known as the commitment loss, which basically penalizes the encodings if they stray too far from their selected code words. Now this loss looks a lot like the codebook loss, except that it updates the encoder instead of the codebook due to the stop gradient being in a different location. Okay, great. So now we've gone through all the basics of the VQVAE. But before we end, I'd like to return to a question we raised at the beginning, which is, why do we have to deal with all this? Or in other words, why should we discretize and limit the size of our codebook instead of using an infinite codebook, which is what the continuous VAE does? Well, there are at least three distinct advantages to quantization. Firstly, as the authors of the VQVAE paper note, 
some modalities, such as speech and text, are naturally modeled by discrete representations. In fact, for example, vector quantization has long been used for tasks involving speech in contexts that don't involve any deep learning. Quantization has also long been used for image compression, for example, in the JPEG format, which uses scalar quantization as part of its method. And this brings us to our next advantage, which is compression of data. Let's say we have a VAE with a latent space of eight dimensions, and each latent variable value is described by a 32-bit float. That means that in total, we have a 256-bit latent vector. This is because there are two to the power of 256 possible values that our latent vector can take. Now imagine that we have a limited codebook size of 1024 vectors to choose from, and the size of our latent encoding grid is 4 by 4 pixels, with 16 in the latent dimension. Now, this means that there are 10 bits in each quantized vector and 160 bits overall. Depending on our input data, this may be sufficient to produce good reconstructions. But the point is, in many scenarios, we could probably achieve significant compression without suffering much deterioration in reconstruction performance just by quantizing. And note here additionally that in the quantized scheme, our latent dimension 16 actually does not feature in the information calculation at all. Now the third advantage is that the VQVAE is a natural model to use for tokenization, especially in raw domains such as audio or images. This is because our collection of code words is learnt during training, so the model can learn the appropriate tokens to use in some downstream task. And of course this means we can utilize advanced models such as transformers. And indeed this combined approach has been used to great effect in the generation of images, speech, and music. For example, one group trained a VQVAE to form image tokens, then combined this with a transformer-based diffusion model to perform text-to-image synthesis. Similarly, the creators of Jukebox use a hierarchical set of VQVAEs and some transformer models to generate music by sampling music tokens conditioned on high-level descriptors. So there we have it. We've now seen how VQVAEs work, and how they can be very useful in all sorts of applications, from compression to generation and more.